Welcome, everyone, to the Most Notorious Podcast. I'm Eric Rivenis. Appreciate you tuning in. Just a reminder, if you prefer listening to the show without ads, join Most Notorious Plus on Apple Podcasts or become a patron at patreon.com slash mostnotorious. Let's get to this interview, and it's an epic one all about James Dean, the tragic car crash, and the strange journey of the car he died in. All coming up now. My guest today is Lee Raskin. He is an internationally recognized expert on James Dean and an early Porsche historian. He has consulted and or appeared in many television documentaries about James Dean and his death. I don't think anyone knows more about the subject in the world than he does. And he has written a book called James Dean on the Road to Salinas. So great to have you on the show Thank you for being a guest. Eric, uh, thank you. It's really an honor to be on your your podcast. I look forward to it. Thank you. So, James Dean, you were a fan of his while he was still alive, right? So your perspective is a little unique because Dean, of course, didn't really become the iconic Hollywood figure he has until after his death. That's correct. I guess that makes me a fossil because James Dean would be, uh, he would be 93 years old. Could you talk about that connection, what he meant to you and to your sister as well? Sure. It's my pleasure. Well, yeah, it's, I, my sister Lainey was a teenager when James Dean broke into live TV. It's interesting because uh, a lot of James Dean's contemporaries, their goal was to get on Broadway, and uh, James Dean as well, but he saw the light with uh, black and white live TV. Uh, There were a number of sponsors uh, in the mid-50s. There was uh, programs like uh, General Electric Theater, uh, CBS Theater, uh, Schlitz, which was a beer company, sponsored uh, live TV. And James Dean tried out and actually co-starred in uh, more than a dozen live uh, performances that basically were 30-minute 30 30 minute spots. And I think that, uh, to James Dean's credit, he was recognized uh, with a new fan base, a teenage fan base, that was very excited to watch James Dean whenever he was performing. Um, In the mid-50s, we had an American household with one TV, and it was a little black and white television. And um, in my household, there were voting rights about what we were going to watch. But my sister was always promoting James Dean, so the family watched James Dean's performances every chance we got. So I really, um, uh, you know, as a as a youngster, nine and ten years old, I really I really didn't grasp the situation. I saw my sister was very excited about watching it. Sometimes she had girlfriends over, and they were excited every time he had a performance. Uh, it's reminiscent of when Elvis Presley broke uh, into entertainment, as well as the Beatles. It was loud and exciting, and right. a lot of applause whenever he. Um, whenever he appeared. So I, um, I knew about James Dean at an early age. And um, shortly thereafter, during 1954 and 55, I became aware that James Dean was uh, involved in motorsport. I saw where he was interviewed once about racing, sports car racing. And he had a message, a PSA with Gig Young, uh, talking to a young audience that it's important to drive safely, which later on became quite ironic. In 
history in 1954, I lived in Omaha, Nebraska, and I asked my father if he would take me to the sports car races at Offutt Air Force Base. And um, Offutt was uh, under the command of General Curtis LeMay. He was the Supreme General of the uh, Strategic Air Command, and he was a grassroots racer, and he brought sports car racing to Offutt, and I was there. It was my first experience of sights and sounds and smells of racing, and I actually met a few drivers, and I realized that James Dean was like like them. And so I, I instantly gravitated towards the racing, and I realized that James Dean had uh, purchased a Porsche Speedster in 1955, and I saw photos of James Dean racing the car uh, in uh, some of the uh, fan magazines, the Hollywood fan magazines. So all of a sudden, my interest went beyond James Dean the actor to James Dean the racer. And I, at that time, started buying uh, motorsport magazines at the corner drugstore, uh, Road and Track, Sports Car Illustrated. And sure enough, there was James Dean, you know, appearing in some of those magazines with his car uh, during 1955. So that was the beginning of my interest in James Dean, whereas most teenagers saw him as an inspiring actor, a very handsome guy. But I saw him as um, a racer and in a Porsche, which was new to this country, new to America. Absolutely, yeah. So let's get into Dean's early life, how he got into acting and what his big break was. Well, it's a a very complex story. James Dean uh, was a Hoosier. He was born in Indiana in a rural uh, farm town called Fairmount. And James Dean uh, grew up as a youngster in Fairmount. His father was a dental technician and employed by the Veterans Administration. And um, James Dean was born in 1931. And I would think that by 1938, his father was transferred to Los Angeles to work at the Sawtell Veterans Administration in West Los Angeles, uh, opposite UCLA. So they moved to Santa Monica, and James Dean began uh, school as in kindergarten. It's interesting because he showed up at school wearing bib overalls, and there was a lot of laughter, and uh, he was ridiculed because they saw him as a hayseed. So... That was embarrassing to James Dean, but he had a personality that overshadowed that, and he had a lot of little friends. Unfortunately, uh, at the age of nine, James Dean's mother was diagnosed with cervical cancer, and um, the treatment of cancer in those days was at best primitive, and she died shortly thereafter. And his father uh, was distraught. He um, didn't feel that he could raise James Dean or Jimmy because he was working hard uh, for the Veterans Administration. So the decision was made shortly after, very shortly after she passed away, to uh, send James Dean back to Fairmont, Indiana to live uh, with Winton, that was his father's name, to Winton Dean's sister, Hortense Winslow. So Jimmy accompanied his mother's coffin back to Fairmont, where she was buried, and he began the second stage in his young life living with his aunt and uncle on a very big farm in Fairmont. Uh, Jimmy grew up in Fairmont, went to elementary school, junior high, high school, established himself as a very, very good athlete, a basketball player, although he was only 5'8", 5'9". He was a terrific forward. He ran track. He played baseball. And um, he also established himself as an artist. He, He could draw. He could paint. And more importantly, he could act. And at every opportunity uh, during his high school years, he uh, was the star in their uh, many performances that the school put on. 
Um, at graduation, uh, most of Jimmy's uh, friends stayed in Fairmont. They didn't go to college, but Jimmy had an opportunity uh, to go back to California to live with his father who had remarried and to attend uh, Santa Monica City Community College. And so he started, his father uh, wanted Jimmy to become a lawyer, so he uh, took courses in pre-law. But the acting uh, crept up and he decided that he was going to be a better actor than an academic student. And he wanted to transfer to UCLA, which had a very strong uh, film acting school. And uh, he transferred to UCLA and immediately established himself as an actor. He starred in Macbeth and other various plays uh, that the you know university had. From there, he uh, by chance he was selected um, for his first paid performance in a Pepsi Cola commercial, and it wasn't a talking role, but it was a visual role, and he loved it. He played himself uh, in a little uh, commercial, uh, which actually is, is readily available on YouTube. And from there, he uh, took acting classes. And under the tutelage of uh, the great actor, uh, James Whitmore, James Whitmore suggested that if Jimmy really wanted to be an actor, then he had to go to New York. So he dropped out of school, packed his bag, and headed to New York City to begin what became a very, very recognized acting career in television on Broadway. And then um, he was discovered by uh, film director Ely Kazan on Broadway, who selected him to uh, co-star in his first movie, uh, John Steinbeck's East of Eden. So that and that covers about, let's see, well, it covers from 19, I'd say 1951 through 1954. That was the beginning of Jimmy's acting career. And I might say that he was very, very lucky, very talented. And a lot of his uh, contemporaries were struggling. I mean, really struggling in New York to find just meager jobs. And Jimmy was um, on the fast track. So did Dean have the ability to play different kinds of roles over his uh, brief acting career? Or was he appropriately typecast as the angst-ridden, outcast character? Because that's what he was good at. Now, I think Jimmy was a bit of a chameleon. You know, he was invited to join the actor's uh, school. And um, he was actually the youngest actor, male or female, to uh, been inducted into the actor school. That's Lee Strasberg's uh, actor studio. And of course, that was, uh, you know, that's where they really urged everyone to become a sort of typecast in method acting. And Jimmy had his own method. I mean, you know, whether it was um, smoking a cigarette or drinking a cup of coffee, he accentuated his movements. And, um, not to say that they were phony. They were more realistic than most of the other actors. I think that Jimmy had a, had a personality that could change like a chameleon. And he, um, he took on some very challenging roles and very diverse roles. And I think that's one of the, uh, it's one of the reasons why Ily Kazan saw him, that he needed, he needed a James Dean type character to play the role in uh, East of Eden. And Jimmy certainly lived up to that. At what point in his young life does he really get interested in uh, driving fast, <laughs> racing? <laughs> um, and by the way, this this Porsche Spider he's forever connected to was not his first fast vehicle. Well, let me take you back to his childhood. In Fairmount, he had a, a Schwinn bike, and his uncle purchased a little whizzer engine to be uh, fitted onto the bike. They lived just down the road from uh, Carter's Motors, which was a motorcycle shop. So uh, Jimmy spent a lot of time there, you know, after school, before he arrived home, he could stop at Carter's and have a glass of milk and some apple pie. And he learned, um, he learned a lot about motorcycles, you know, how to, 
how to tune them and then how to ride them. So uh, before he was a teenager, he found himself with a Schwinn powered by a Whizzer. Incidentally, the Whizzer name came from the famous football player, Whizzer White, who later became a Supreme Court justice. So he, uh, you know, he was whizzing around on his Whizzer. And then as he got older, his uncle bought a small motorcycle, a 125cc Czechoslovakian motorcycle they called it a cz 125 and jimmy <laughs> jimmy uh took that took that bike everywhere he went to school every day with it and uh and then that was the beginning from there he graduated into some real motorcycles and in fairmount he had a royal enfield for a while which he drove to new york and then in new york uh, right before in New York, he had an Indian motorcycle, and then when he went to California, he uh, stored the Indian. And uh, when he got to California, he all of a sudden found himself with a lucrative contract and bought himself a Triumph uh, 650, as well as a used MGTD sports car. So this was 1954, going into 1955. And um, he befriended John von Neumann, who had the first West Coast Porsche distributor dealership. And Porsche had just come out with a brand new model called the Speedster, type 540 Speedster. It was a convertible, but it was uh, produced and, and used for racing. It had a cut down windshield. It was a light body very sparse, no radio. So Jimmy decided not only was he going to buy the Speedster, because he had the cash to do it, but he was also going to race the Speedster. And he entered his first race in Palm Springs, uh, basically two weeks, three weeks after he bought the car in February of 1955. So 1955 was a busy year for him. J James Dean was, you know, king of the hill. He he was co-starring in uh, East of Eden, and he was signed by uh, Warner Brothers to do as many as five or six other full-length films. And uh, after East of Eden, his next film would be Rebel Without a Cause, where he co-starred with Natalie Wood. And um, it was that time, that's when he bought the car and raced it. And... Um, the studio, Warner, Warner Brothers, wasn't particularly happy about that because they realized that there was a danger to amateur sports car racing. So they said they gave him a mandate that he could not race while he was filming. But being a very clever lad, James Dean said, well, you know what? There's, I usually have a week or two weeks between films. I'm going to race then. So he rearranged his schedule and he raced at Palm Springs, and then in between uh, Rebel Without a Cause and his third movie, Giant, he was able to race at Bakersfield in Santa Barbara. And then um, he finished, incidentally, first in his novice class at Palm Springs, which qualified him for the main event on Sunday, where he raced against veteran drivers like Ken Miles. And he actually finished third overall. And due to a technicality on Miles' part, he was disqualified, and Jimmy found himself in second place. And he had the trophies, and of course, there was a lot of publicity the next the next day on Monday uh, when he started filming Rebel, because he had all these trophies in a car, and he caught a lot of press in the Hollywood Reporter and Variety. He raced at Bakersfield, finished uh, in his class. And then the third race was Santa Barbara, but he had some mechanical problems and he wound up uh, not finishing. In racing terms, he was a DNF, did not finish. And then he, um, he was off to Martha, Texas to film his third uh, film, which was a blockbuster starring Rock Hudson, Elizabeth Taylor, and James Dean. So his race car driving was kind of a double-edged sword for him, right? On one hand, the studios were petrified he would hurt himself. 
But on the other, his racing fed into this mythos about him that he didn't just play this cool kind of character on screen. He was this way in real life as well, which made the public even more interested in him. Yeah, that's absolutely correct. And, you know, the interesting thing is James Dean was very, very bright at 24. He, he, was, he was already an adult. He knew how to get publicity. You're absolutely right. Warner Brothers had this hot property. They didn't want to risk, um, you know, a, a, an injury or a delay in filming. James Dean always had a photographer with him at the races. He had more publicity photos than any actor uh, on the set. He was, it was just really amazing. And of course, I took advantage of that later on, you know, in my career, because I had all these great photographs to use uh, for, for my books, for my many books that I've, that I've published uh, on James Dean. So, James Dean, when he was in Texas, he was down there for about a month. Uh, all of June, May, end of May, all of June came back in July. He wasn't able to race. As a matter of fact, they wouldn't let him uh, bring his Porsche Speedster down there. They didn't want him driving that. He had a Chevy Rent-A-Car while he was down there. And he couldn't wait to get back into racing. Now, the interesting thing is he loved racing, but it was his craft of acting that allowed him to afford the affordability of owning an expensive Porsche Speedster, which sold for just under $3,000. And then when he came back from uh, Martha, Texas, he hadn't raced. And there were other racers who were getting better because they had what I call more seat time. And he was getting stale. So he decided he needed a faster car. And he wound up, after looking at various other cars, he wound up with a new Porsche Spider. They only made 90 of these models. It was the 550, Type 550, and it was a very light, all-aluminum car uh, that was capable of going 130 miles an hour. And so through his friendship of, with John Von Neumann at Competition Motors, he was able to get a car that was delivered. They had six new spiders that were delivered to John von Neumann. And evidently, one, one purchaser backed out of the deal, and James Dean got the sixth car. It was silver with a red interior and a red racing stripe. But John von Neumann was a little uncertain about James Dean's racing ability. He thought he needed more seat time, more experience. So he mandated that a factory-trained mechanic... Rolf Wutterich would go with James Dean to every race to make sure that the car was tuned properly and that James Dean, you know, had the best support as possible. So this car has become almost as legendary as James Dean himself, and it's known as the Little Bastard. Yeah, Little Bastard. Yeah. So... It, the car is a beautiful car. It's a lot of photos, silver with a red racing stripe. And he took it to a car customizer by the name of Dean Jeffries, who was a pinstriper. There's some confusion, confusion in that another customizer, George Barris, took credit for it. But George Barris had nothing to do with writing um, or actually uh, lettering Little Bastard. On the car it was Dean Jeffries, and Dean Jeffries was uh, also a uh, a uh, Hollywood type uh, customizer. So the little bastard. Well, in 1955, that's a very powerful name, and a name that doesn't get publicized very often because it has a connotation. So there's many stories that have evolved about the little bastard, but the actual story goes like this. When James Dean was filming in Burbank for Warner Brothers, he had um, finished East of Eden. He was living on a tra in a trailer on the lot, which was not unusual. A lot of a lot of uh, actors and actresses, you know, had their own trailers and they stayed on the lot. And so uh, James Dean uh, decided that that was um, a freebie. He liked staying in the trailer. It didn't cost him anything. So he stayed there, and Jack Warner, president of Warner Brothers, didn't like it. 
he wanted that trailer freed up for someone else. So he told his assistant, get that little bastard off the lot. <laughs> and so they basically threw James Dean out of the trailer. And James Dean said, you know, one of these days I'm going to get back at, at uh, Jack Warner. And he did. He said, I'm going to call my car the little bastard. And everybody's going to know when I'm racing that the little bastard is in the lead. So it was very clever. It's the first time that I know of that a racer, a driver in the Cal Club, California Sports Car Club, put some kind of name, you know, a curse word on a car. I mean, they could have called it uh, Old Blue, Old Yeller, um, Big Bob, but no, he had Little Bastard. So that became infamous. And today, everybody refers to James Dean Spider as the little bastard. Uh, I took it a little further. I wanted to know the VIN, the vehicle identification number. Porsche themselves didn't know. And through, you know, through a series of letters back and forth with Porsche, we were able to present the engine number and they sent us an official document that said the number was 550-0 zero zero five five so that's a name wow. a number that will live in infamy and it's a mirror image of itself wow yeah yeah that's a unique identification number so i want to ask you about this dinner dean has with alec guinness would you tell us how they meet and what they talk about yeah, absolutely. So the uh, interview with Alec Guinness took place um, about 25 years after his death. I mean, it was it was not significant initially, and then people started to put the puzzle pieces together. So here's here's what I recall. James Dean uh, had a favorite restaurant called the Villa Capri. It was on McCadden in North Hollywood. It was an Italian restaurant. It was the uh, owner was Patsy D'Amore. And um, James Dean and his best friend, Lou Bracker, used to frequent the Villa Capri. And a very popular, very popular restaurant. Frank Sinatra, Marilyn Monroe, Sammy Davis Jr. A lot of, uh, lot of seasoned actors, actresses would... Um, show up there for drinks and dinner. And um, on a particular night, it was uh, it was just a few nights after James Dean purchased his Speedster. Let's see, purchased uh, the, uh, the Spider, rather. James Dean purchased his Spider on September 21st. So this was probably on the 23rd, mid midweek. James Dean was having dinner with uh, Lou Bracker midweek at the Villa Capri. And... Um, it was crowded, and uh, it appears that Sir Alec Guinness, who was British, came to the door with his date, Thelma Moss, whose brother was a uh, movie director in um, Hollywood, and they uh, were turned away because there weren't any available tables. And Lou Bracker said to Jimmy, look, there's Alec Guinness, and Jimmy bolted out and chased Alec Guinness and Thelma Moss down the driveway and introduced himself. I'm, Jane, I'm James Dean, and um, so it's an honor to meet you, Mr. Guinness. And why don't you come back? There's plenty of room at our table. So Sir Alec Guinness and uh, Thelma Moss, they shook their head. And Jimmy said, but first I want to show you, I just, I just purchased a new sports car. It's sitting right over there. It's a Porsche Spider." And Alec Guinness and Jimmy and Thelma Moss walked over to the car. And Alec Guinness really was not too impressed or really didn't have any knowledge of, of a German Porsche sports car. But he had a premonition. And he said, you know, um, I have a very strong feeling. And um, I don't think you should get in that car. I, I think that let's see, today is, he said Thursday, but actually it was Wednesday. He said, um, I think that if you get in this car, 
by Friday night, you'll be dead. And James Dean looked at him like, are you kidding me? And Alec Guinness um, said, no, this, uh, I have a very strong feeling. This car is um, not for you. Well, anyway, they went back into the restaurant. Jimmy sort of shrugged it off, but he did recant the story to Lou Bracker. And then years later, Alec Guinness told the story. Now, some of his facts were off, but the interesting thing is Jimmy died on that Friday, two days or a day, the day later, when Alec told him, don't get in the car. So there's a lot of conjecture about why did Alec Guinness say that? I mean, here's a situation where James Dean was beaming with pride. He owned this brand new Porsche Spider. He's going to take it racing. And Alec Guinness said, car's going to kill you. So a lot's been made of that. My feeling, I was asked a number of times, what, you know, what's my comment? What do, what do I feel about this? And I said, you know, Alec Guinness is no longer among us, but perhaps he was clairvoyant. Maybe he had that sixth sense and really felt uh, that James Dean was going to die in that car. And of course he did. On September 30th, James Dean and his entourage was a mechanic, Rolf Witterick. He uh, entrusted um, his station wagon to a good friend, a stunt driver named Bill Hickman. And, of course, he had a photographer, Sanford Roth, who accompanied them, and they were going to drive to Salinas, uh, which is approximately 300 miles from Los Angeles. They left on Friday, September 30th. Um, There's a lot of speculation about the car being on on a trailer. It was a lone trailer. Station Wagon was going to tow the trailer, but they decided to take it off the trailer. Actually... The decision was made by the mechanic not to trailer the car because the car only had a few hundred miles on it and the engine needed to be broken in. So they decided that James Dean and Rolf would drive the car and then the station wagon with the empty trailer would follow them. And so they proceeded uh, to leave at approximately uh, approximately one o'clock in the afternoon and their trip is basically uh, very simple. They they left Hollywood and went up Route 99, Sepulveda Boulevard. There were no interstates in those days, so they went up 99 and then took they took a road called the Racers Road, which brought them over to the left, to the west of Bakersfield, and they made they made a, a stop there at Blackwell's Corner, and on their way west on Route 466, they had to go through a a mountainous area and down a a very sharp grade called Polonial Pass. And uh, Jimmy was driving quite fast. And along the way, he had uh, encountered uh, some of his friends at Blackwell's Corner, Lance Ravetlo and Bruce Kessler, and they agreed that they would meet for dinner at Paso Robles on Route uh, Route 1 or Route 101 in California. And so Jimmy's driving quite fast, and he's passing cars along the way. And uh, as they got down the, as they went down the grade of Polonio, down to a junction, a lot of people call it an intersection, but it was the Shalane Junction of Route 466 and 41, Jimmy saw a car approaching, and all of a sudden, he turned in front of Jimmy, making a left turn. And Jimmy instinctively used a racing maneuver to pull, swing to the right and to power drive or power slide the car around this other car, which had stopped in his lane. The other driver suddenly saw that there was a car and and froze and slammed on the brakes and stopped. Unfortunately, Jimmy lost control of the car, and there was a a practically head-on collision, left front of this 1950 Ford against the left front of the Porsche. They both were going so fast that the cars imploded 
upon impact, the rear end of the Ford went up in the air. The Porsche went up and spiraled in the air. The Ford, which weighed over two tons, was pushed backwards 45 feet. And the Porsche was completely demolished and wound up about 50 feet off to the right in a gully. And um, James Dean was mortally wounded severely injured. The mechanic was thrown out of the car. And it's interesting, if you can picture the car crashes into the Ford and then spirals 90 degrees and turn, does a, bell, a belly roll over counterclock or clockwise, and the car came down on its wheels five feet from where the mechanic was thrown and landed in the dirt on the shoulder. So easily, the mechanic could have been crushed by the car, but was saved by a distance of five feet. James Dean was a captive individual in that car because his left foot was crushed between the clutch pedal and the brake. Otherwise, he would have been thrown out of the car, but he remained in the car and had taken the brunt of the uh, collision, the, the Porsche was only 39 inches high. The Ford was twice that size and it was all steel. And the front of the Ford made the impact against James Dean's body. Although he may have lingered for a few minutes, he, he was, um, he was uh, mortally wounded. The uh, station wagon was about eight to 10 minutes behind because they were trailering the empty trailer. And when they came up there, they just couldn't believe that there was this horrific accident and that James Dean was dying in the car. The driver of the Ford was a young guy, Donald Turnipseed, age 23. He was a student at Cal Poly in San Luis Obispo, and he was driving home to Tulare and that's why he was making that left turn. And he was speeding because I'm sure he was in a hurry to get home. So I, uh, you know, I've analyzed this accident uh, for many years. I, uh, my conclusion is that this truly was an unguarded moment for both James Dean and Donald Turnipsey. Each was speeding in the opposite direction to reach a destination. and. Unfortunately, the two cars came together in a horrific crash, probably the most notable crash in, uh, in American history that is still talked about today, you know, 68, 68 years later. So this was how James Dean's legacy began. It began, it began with his death. He was on his way to do many more photos, perhaps becoming a uh, a very accomplished director in Hollywood and in the entertainment industry, but his life ended at the age of 24 in a Porsche. So what do you think about the fact that neither man was wearing a seatbelt? Did that matter in this particular accident? What, what are your thoughts on that? Well, ironically, they were late in leaving uh, Competition Motors because Rolf Woodrick was installing a seatbelt for the driver. But of course, there was no need for a seatbelt on the passenger side because it was a race car and only one person was going to be in the car at the time. So yes, there was a seatbelt, but James Dean wasn't wearing it. But in analyzing the accident and the, da and the resulting damage, it wouldn't have mattered. James Dean took a terrific hit by that 1950 Ford, and he, he didn't survive. And the car was an aluminum-bodied car weighing only 1,300 pounds. It was made to race, and it wasn't built to sustain a huge impact like that. During the 50s, there were a lot of drivers, a lot of race drivers driving competition cars that were severely injured and many who died. Dozens died in a race. 
because race cars weren't being built to protect the driver. They were built to win. They were light. They were fast. They were sleek. They were aerodynamic. So it's interesting because there is a lot of speculation. If James Dean had been wearing a seatbelt, if there had been an airbag, blah, blah, blah. But this is 1955, and we're, you know, we're looking and we're judging, um, we're judging that accident on today's standards of safety. And that just wasn't uh, an issue back then at all. Right, for sure. So what can you tell us about his autopsy? Was there anything about it that was surprising, shocking in any way? That's an interesting question, Eric. Uh, No one's ever asked that before. So James Dean uh, was taken by ambulance. And incidentally, uh, there was a gas station and an ambulance service a mile away west of the junction. And you say to yourself, well, I, you know, of course, you know, gas stations along the route, but why was there an ambulance service there? There were only 50 people that lived in Shalem. It's because there were so many accidents at that particular junction. A lot of oh, bad wow. accidents, a lot of deaths. It's an interesting uh, visual experience. It's like the desert. It's sandy. It's barren. It's so hot that there's no green uh there's no greenery. The the grass turns golden yellow. It's almost like hay. And James Dean was coming down this polonial pass with the sun in his eye. And when he got to what I call the flats or the bottom of the junction, the bluffs behind him blocked the sun. Now, that only happens at dusk. So The accident occurred at 5.45 p.m. California time. So everybody said, well, it's 5.45, you know, on September 30th. Why would there be shadows? Well, the interesting thing is I looked back into history and I found that daylight savings time existed in California in 1955 but it was over on Labor Day, September 1st. So we're not talking about 545 Daylight Savings Time. We're talking about 545 Pacific Time, an hour difference. And of course there are shadows. It was dusk at the junction, but coming you know, from the Polonial Pass, which is over 100 feet higher than sea level, it was sunny. So it's interesting because that transition occurred very quickly as James Dean was driving 80 to 90 miles an hour down the slope and into the, into the junction. You know, if, if I could have been there and I could have warned James Dean, I would have said, take your foot off the accelerator, slow down. It's a dangerous junction. But that didn't happen. And there was yet another accident and it was a fatal accident. So. There was an autopsy. James Dean was taken by ambulance. The ambulance was there because there were so many accidents. They pried him out with a crowbar, put him in the ambulance along with Rolf Witterick, who was severely injured. His head smashed against the dashboard. He lost his teeth. He bit his tongue. He was bleeding profusely. His hip and his thigh were turned around 180 degrees. So they both were in the ambulance and they took a very quick drive to um, Paso Robles, and um, it was about 26 miles, and they got there in 20 minutes. James Dean was pronounced dead on arrival. He was DOA by Dr. Bosett at the Paso Robles War Memorial Hospital, and Ralph uh, Roderick uh, was entered into the hospital with uh, severe injuries. Uh, James Dean's body was taken over to uh, mortuary, Kuehl's mortuary uh, funeral home in uh, Paso Robles. And um, because of the extent of his injury, uh, there was very little blood left in his body. But they did an analysis. There was no alcohol involved in this. And the autopsy showed massive lacerations on the face 
that his uh, his forehead was caved in, his chest was caved in, his limbs were fractured. He just couldn't survive that kind of massive contact or the impact. So there was an inquest held on October 11th. And of course, uh, it was well attended because uh, it was James Dean, the actor, that was killed. And there was a, a judge and a jury. And um, the jury deliberated. And within, within 30 minutes, they came back with a verdict that neither party was guilty. Neither party. Um, I did a little um, checking into the, into the California uh, Motor Vehicle Code of 1955, as I thought that, you know, there may have been some circumstances that I would be unfamiliar with. But it's found that when an individual is driving and is making a left turn, and there were two things that he had to do initially, that was to signal that he was turning left either with a hand signal with his left hand at straight out in a mechanical turn signal, uh, either or, and that he had to yield to an oncoming car. James Dean had the oncoming car, Donald Turnipseed needed to stop and yield and he didn't yield. So he crossed the center line and then froze and James Dean ran into him. So he did apply the brakes and left the skid marks um, on the road, on the highway, which which tells me and everybody else that he did see James Dean, but he saw him too late. A few and I had been making that left turn, and we had caused an accident, and the other driver was fatally killed. We'd be charged at least with a misdemeanor manslaughter, and Donald Turnipseed was not. And there's several reasons why he was not. The speculation is, well, he's a Navy veteran and going to school under the GI Bill and his wife is pregnant and he's going home to visit her and he's a local. He's a local. He lives in the area. On the other hand, James Dean is this young actor, 24 years old from Hollywood, driving a German sports car with a German mechanic who is an alumnus of the Luftwaffe from World War II. And we're talking about 10 years after the war, there's still a lot of sentiment about World War II. So there was no verdict of guilt assigned to Donald Turnipseed or to James Dean. I think things would, you know, should have been different, but they weren't. So Donald Turnipseed was advised during the inquest by his attorney to keep his mouth shut, which he did. James Dean was not represented by counsel, which I think was a grievous legal error. There was no counsel, there was no attorney to discuss the accident on behalf of James Dean. Roth Woodrick had been interviewed at the hospital. He was uh, heavily drugged with morphine. He was uh, not lucid. He spoke German. They had a translator. The translator spoke German, but he um, wasn't as factual as he should have been. They asked Rolf Woodrick how fast he was going, and Rolf said 50, 55, 60 on the average. So they basically said, well, he wasn't speeding. But Rolf wasn't talking about miles per hour. He doesn't even, you know, he was, wasn't even talking about kilometers per hour. He was talking about revolutions per minute on the tachometer. And so when you extrapolate revolutions to miles per hour in a 550 Porsche in fourth gear, you'd have to say, well, minimally, he was going 80 miles an hour and could have been going 95 at 50, 55, 60, or 6,000 RPM. Uh, I'm the first person and the only person to recognize that fact, that that was a, a, a grave error, a, a legal error uh, in judgment. And um, it, it makes a lot of difference because there were a lot of documentaries and a lot of simulations that said, oh, James Dean was only going 55 miles an hour. 
And that's not true. He was speedy. And there was a husband and wife who were an eyewitness to the accident. James Dean had just passed them. And they said that they were going close to 70 miles an hour. And James Dean passed them like they were tied to a post. And this was a, a, about a minute or a mile away from the accident. So um, their deposition, which was taken in Spokane, Washington, incidentally, their, their names were uh, Mr. and Mrs. White. Robert White was a CPA for Price Waterhouse. So pretty intelligent guy. His wife was also intelligent and their testimony was certainly intelligent. And they were, were able to explain exactly what they saw. And um, their deposition was taken in Spokane and um, it didn't get to the inquest in time. There was no Federal Express in those days. They just put it in the mailbox and it came a day or two days later. Their testimony would have significantly changed the outcome with facts to the inquest and it didn't. So that's nothing that can be changed, but it is significant because it is factual and there's a lot of attribution to what Mr. and Mrs. White said. Interesting, gosh. So Donald Turnipseed, he felt guilty, right? For years afterwards. No, that's correct. I mean, it's, you know, it's really extraordinary. Here's a, here's a guy that's a Navy veteran going to school, his wife is pregnant. He crashes into James Dean and kills him. And he had to live with that. As I mentioned earlier, his attorney said, keep your mouth shut, which he did. He never really wanted to discuss the accident. He did one interview. Basically, it went like this. I didn't see him until it was too late. Initially, he said, I didn't see him at all. But when they showed that he hit the brakes twice and put down skid marks, it's obvious that he hit the brakes, probably went back on the gas, and then realized that he wasn't going to clear the accident and clear the oncoming car. He hit the brakes again. Now, we're talking about a manual shift, and he was driving pretty fast, making the left turn. It, and it wasn't a conventional left turn where you're heading east and you turn left. It was, it was like a 45-degree turn. In other words, he was cutting the corner. And he probably was damn near close to up on two wheels because he was driving pretty fast. So he didn't say anything. And years later, a lot of individuals tried to talk with him and interview him. Uh, someone approached me, I would say, probably about 15 years ago. Donald Turnipseed actually became a very, a very lucrative businessman. He had an electrical contracting company. He had a lot of uh, local or government contracts. He was driving a Mercedes Benz and he would take it into Bakersfield for service. And I was approached by the former service manager saying that he approached Donald Turnipseed and he basically went like this, like, aren't you Donald Turnipseed who crashed into James Dean? And, you know, would you like to tell me, you know, what happened? And Donald Turnipseed turned back to the service manager who said, no, I'm not going to tell you anything. And if you ask me one more question, I'm not going to be a client of your Mercedes dealership. He actually refused to talk about the accident. He died of cancer as a young man. And um, it's, in, it's interesting because his, his Ford, which was demolished, I guess was totaled by the insurance company and he was paid off and no one seems to know what happened. So there's the first example a vehicle involved in this mysterious crash that also becomes mysterious because it disappeared in the thin air. Nobody's ever been able to find that car. Wow. So yeah, let, let's talk a bit about the curse of the little bastard. Would you tell us the journey Dean's Porsche Spider takes after the crash? Who was first to get their hands on it? Eric, this, this part of the story becomes more significant after 68 years than anything else. It goes something like this. The car was uh, towed by the ambulance service. They had a tow truck there because of the accidents to the Shalem garage. 
and there were uh, there was a lot of photographs taken of the car. Sanford Roth, the photographer who accompanied James Dean on that fateful day, took a lot of photos. Now he maintains that he didn't take any photos of James Dean in the car after the crash. He may or may not have, but they certainly weren't published. And I commend I commend Sanford Roth for not publishing the photographs that he may or may have taken, may or may not have taken during the the accident. But he did take photos of the car in the garage and beyond behind the uh, spider there. You can also see the Ford because it was in the same garage. So the uh, Porsche was uh, picked up by Competition Motors. Johnny Von Neumann was also on his way to the Salinas races and stopped at the accident scene. Couldn't believe what he saw, but he was instrumental in removing the personal items from James Dean's car which also included Rolf's 35-meter Leica camera, which had color photos of James Dean that were taken earlier that day at Competition Motors and also at the mobile station on Ventura Boulevard before they got on the route to Salinas. The car was picked up by uh, Competition Motors, taken to Competition Motors. The insurance company wrote off the car as a total a total uh, wreck and paid James Dean's father, the next of kin, approximately $5,000 in settlement. The car cost new $6,800. So in a normal procedure where you're involved in an accident, the car is total, the insurance company writes a check, you know, for the whatever their value is. They take the car, you take the cash. Most people don't think about, well, what happened to my car? Well, in this particular situation, the car went to all auto parts, a salvage yard in Burbank, California. And it was then offered for sale. Well, you can imagine there was so much publicity about the accident and the car. A racer who raced against James Dean in all three of his races. His name was William Eskridge. Dr. William Eskridge was a family doctor in Burbank, California, just opposite of Warner Brothers. Well, he knew James Dean. He had raced against him and knew what he had. Well, he was a racer himself, and he realized that the engine in this Porsche Spider was undamaged. $6,800 car, The body was completely, you know, total, but the engine was and the transmission were virtually undamaged. The transmission, incidentally, was jammed into fourth gear. That's how I know that it was in fourth gear and I could extrapolate the speed. So Dr. Eskridge purchased the entire package for $1,092. And I have seen the bill of sale. It was $1,050 plus sales tax. He bought the engine because in the back of his mind, he said, I can use this. He then bought a Lotus Mark 8, which came from England without an engine. Now, you know, Chevrolet, you build it, you buy a Chevrolet, it comes with a Chevrolet engine. You buy an MG, it comes with an MG engine. You buy a Morgan, a British Morgan, it comes without an engine, and you buy a Lotus and an Elva without an engine. You, it allowed the owner, you know, to use the option of putting any engine he wanted into the car. So this Lotus was very sleek, all aluminum, didn't have an engine, and he said, you know, I'm going to take the Porsche engine and put it in the car. Now, the Porsche has a, it was a rear engine car, the 356 and the 550. Actually, the 550, it, it was mid-engine. It was between the front and the back, mid-engine. So being a doctor, you know, to his credit, a medical doctor, he could have been an engineer. He was absolutely brilliant, Dr. Eskridge. He took the engine and mounted it up front and then used a MG transmission to match the engine. To um, you know, for its final power, he um, actually was very successful 
in this venture, this project, and he named it POTUS, P-O-T-U-S, in capital letters, which stood for Portia Lotus. Now, how clever was he? President of the United States. <laughs> right. There are photos of the car, and he painted POTUS on the side of it. James Dean had a little bastard, and he had POTUS. So Dr. Eskridge was pretty successful, although in a good driver, but he had, you know, he had to sort out his mechanical problems uh, along the way. The car is actually raced in, um, he bought the car in November of 1955. James Dean died in September 30th, 1955, and he started racing it during 1956. Okay, so William Eskridge, medical doctor, Burbank, California, had his own shop. He took the engine out, the transmission. All the other parts were not usable in this car, so he, because they were Porsche parts, so he lent them to a good friend, Dr. Troy McHenry, a Beverly Hills surgeon who had a 550 Porsche, and these became spare parts. They were worth their weight in gold. The car was absolutely a mess. It was just, it was, someone referred to it as like a crumpled pack of cigarettes. And it was scheduled to be sent to the San Fernando dump. Except along the way, word got out among motorsport participants that the car, I call it the carcass, was available. So a car customizer, the other car customizer, George Barris, somehow obtained the parts, the carcass. Now, Barris maintains in his book in every interview that he had that he bought the car from the family. Well, that's not true. As I explained, the father was paid for the car, went to, went to a salvage yard, and then Dr. Eskridge bought it. And Dr. Eskridge, incidentally, got title to the car. Why? Well, in those days, in 1955, in California, the vehicle identification number, the VIN, which normally would be the chassis, the number stamped on the chassis, the doors, and various parts, that wasn't the case. In California, they used the engine number. The serial number of the engine appeared on your registration, which they called the pink slip in California. So, as I explained, Dr. Eskridge bought the carcass and the engine and used the engine and threw away the other parts but he maintained the ownership and if there were a new registration card it would be William Eskridge with the engine number so George Barris gets this carcass and he decides that he's going to lend it out to the Los Angeles Safety Council for display under the guise that speed kills. So it goes back to the PSA that James Dean did with Gig Young, saying, oh, I'm extra cautious on the racetrack and on a public highway. Well, it's ironic that he wasn't extra cautious and he wound up killing himself. So George Barris hammers out some aluminum on the car because it has no integrity, it's falling apart, and he puts it on display at hot rod shows, car shows throughout the Los Angeles area, San Diego. They took it up to Monterey. Then he realized that everybody wanted to touch the car, see the car, and stories evolved that somebody touched the seats and cut their fingers or cut their, their hand on the sharp metal of the car or the car fell off the dolly and broke somebody's leg. And then there was this truck driver named George Bahudis, not George Barris, but George Bahudis, who was taking the car up to a Monterey car show, and the car slid off the, the trailer of the truck and killed this guy. Well, I thought that was a fantastic story and kind of amazing. So I checked the records of fatalities in the state of California during 1956. And we didn't find any George Bahudis. It was completely concocted by George Barris, a similar name, but that's how he promoted this car. 
touch the car and you die. And that was the beginning of the curse of the little bastard. In addition, in 1956, in October, we know that Dr. Eskridge is racing his POTUS with the James Dean engine. And his good friend Troy McHenry is racing his sports car, his Porsche 550, at the same race. And Dr. Eskridge is winning the race, and he's racing against Richie Genther, who's driving a 550 Porsche that's owned by John von Neumann. And they're going what they call nose to tail, in other words, just inches apart. And then there's, in third or fourth place, there is Troy McHenry, who's not as good a driver, and he's racing his 550, supposedly with parts that James Dean had in the transmission, which was not true. But anyway, as it turns out, Troy McHenry had an accident in the race before on that day, and he was trying to fix the steering. And in his haste, he forgot to put the four nuts on the four bolts holding the steering gear, the steering arm, together. And on the third lap, Troy McHenry was waving to his pit crew, something's wrong, something's wrong. Yes, something was wrong. His steering was going away. He didn't have any steering 200 yards later, and he crashed into a tree and killed himself. Therein lies another piece of the curse. Because they said, oh, he had James Dean's parts on the car, and it killed him. So getting back to Dr. Dr. Eskridge and Richie Ginther, they're racing around nose to tail. Dr. Eskridge got into some loose gravel, spun the car around, and they both crashed together, and they were out of the race. The journalist concocted a story that Dr. Eskridge turned over. He was severely injured. So was Richie Ginther. That's not true. Neither were injured. So Pomona, 1956, October, 1956, a story evolves in the Los Angeles Times about the curse of James Dean's spider. And it was like, it was like a story that just never ended. It, people still bring it up over and over and over again. I've been asked many, many times, what do I think about the curse? I think there's a lot of myths that were created by a lot of lame journalists who didn't do their homework and didn't do any fact-checking. And it was more significant and more outrageous to use that under the banner of the curse of James Dean. You actually got to see the car, right? In person. Yeah. As a teenager in Baltimore... I saw James Dean's car at the Baltimore Auto Show in 1960, and I recognized it, but it, did, it wasn't significant to me. I think that teenagers were more interested in a changing culture. It wasn't that speed killed anymore. It's about going fast. It was about Jan and Dean and the Beach Boys talking about Drag City and Dead Man's Curve, and faster, faster, faster. Drag racing became the topic. and didn't matter about James Dean and Speed Kills anymore. So I think the music culture changed the attitude of teenagers and driving fast in fast cars. Ford and Chevy capitalized by making, you know, sedans fast, drag racers. You know, and Ford entered, got involved in a partnership with the Ford Cobra, you know, a very fast race car. So it's ironic that if the movie that Ford versus Ferrari, the star of the movie was a guy named Ken Miles. And here's James Dean racing against Ken Miles at Palm Springs in 1955. What goes around comes around. So the interesting thing is George Barris capitalized on embellishing all the stories. So he said that the car was set to a safety program, a safety show, a safety tour in Miami, Florida in 1960. And then it was shipped back. First, he said on a freight car, then he said in a truck. Actually, his cars were on a truck. If you, would, in fact, were a promoter in uh, Minnesota and you were going to sponsor a car show, George Barris would contact you and say, well, look, 
you've got all these local cars, but I've got the headliners. I can give you 10 cars, movie cars, you know, cars uh, of significance, including James Dean's car. And that's, of course, you'll, you'll pay for that, but you'll, you'll, have a, you'll have a classic show. You'll have a headliner. So that's how he made his money. All these cars were put on a semi-trailer and trucked around. So if, in fact, the car came back from Miami when it got to Compton, when it got to his, his showroom, the car was gone. But they had a Xerox copy of the registration that was shown with the car. And he said, that's all that remained. So this is supposedly in March, early April of 1960. And he said the car disappeared in the thin air. That was his story. I did a little investigation, I'd say within the last decade. And I found that George Barris had supplied, theoretically, had supplied James Dean's car on an invoice to two separate car shows in Arizona, subsequent to when he said the car mysteriously disappeared coming back from Florida. So obviously he got confused, got confused, or the car didn't really disappear at all, not when he said it did. I think the car was falling apart because I've seen photos from show to show to show, and then During 1960, the car wasn't on its wheels anymore. It was on a skid, on a wood skid that, you know, had to be lifted with a forklift. The car was falling apart. Teenagers weren't interested in James Dean. They couldn't picture James Dean wearing bell-bottom pants and a flowered shirt. Just, you know, it just didn't fit. So I think, and this is a pretty bold statement, that George Barris claimed it was stolen, and he collected the insurance, and he disposed of the car. So, in conversations with former employees of of, uh, George Barris, they told me that they saw the car in a container for a number of years, and then it was put up on his roof with a tarp over it. And after that, it just completely disappeared. So again, you do believe that there is a good chance that Barris collected insurance money. Yeah, I do, but I I haven't been able to I haven't been able to substantiate that. The the sad thing is, Eric, is that the majority of people that we're talking about are now deceased. So there's there's no there's no real attribution to be obtained. It's all hearsay now. Yeah, I do think that. And there there's more to the story that isn't concrete yet about well, is the car still out there? Every, practically every, every documentary that I've done on history, Travel Channel, National Geographic, Reels, they're all looking for the little bastard. And that's an unknown. And I probably can substantiate more information than anyone else because I'm still alive and they're not. Do you remember how you felt when you saw the car, uh, James Dean, as you said, had, had made a big impact on your life um, years earlier. So it must have been just momentous for you, right, to see this car in person. I remember exactly. I was very sad. I was 13 years old. I recognized the car. It's the first time that I had ever, I had never seen photos of the wrecked car before. Yeah, I was the only one wide looking at the cars off in the corner. Everyone was looking at dragsters, you know. That, that, was the, that was really what I would call the big heat. You know, that was the hot topic. It was Ford and Chevy and dragsters and drag racing and motorcycles. No one was paying attention to this car. Now, this is Baltimore, Maryland on the East Coast, 3,000 miles away from James Dean's California. Now, If it had been in California, probably would have been a little bit more popular. And I say that based on, you know, who I am and book signings. You know, in California, I have a couple hundred people that would come to a book signing. And in Baltimore, Maryland, I'd be lucky if I could find 25 people, you know. So it's, uh, you know, it's East Coast versus West Coast, right coast versus left coast. It's always been that way. We're a million miles away from Hollywood. 
you know, I live in Baltimore. We have the Baltimore Colts. We have the Colts. We have the Ravens. We have the Orioles. Uh, we have John Waters, Barry Levinson, but that's about it. Uh, you mentioned drag racing for, for a quick second. Uh, I went back and watched the PSA Dean did about the dangers of speeding. And Gig Young asks him about it. Yeah. He, he said, you, have you ever drag race? And then he has a smile on his face and Jimmy smiles back and says, are you kidding me? <laughs> right. And, and the inference was that drag racing was for kids, right? Yeah. I, I would never do that. Of course. Incidentally, a lot of authors like to say that was done a couple of weeks before, before he died. But you, you have to look at what James Dean looked like at the time. When he was filming Giant, he played a young Jed Rink. And then at the end of the movie, they had aged him 50 years. He played an old Jed Rink and his head was shaved back like he had a receding hairline. In the interview with Gig Young, it's the young Jed Rink with a cowboy hat and his elite and his, uh, jeans. So I knew that it was taken in, uh, in July as opposed to August or September when they altered his, uh, his looks. So uh, that's another thing, you know, it, uh, Somebody says, oh, it was taken a couple of weeks before. Well, that's just, a, you know, that's a guess. And what happens is that another writer, you know, just copies it. It's, um, you know, that's just, a, it's a nature of the beast. Rather than do you be authentic, uh, you know, with your own information, it's just easier to lift something. It's called plagiarism. And people do it all the time, unfortunately. The way uh, James Dean interacted with Gig Young in that PSA, it, it was staged, of course, but it was James Dean as James Dean and, and not a character. But was he actually playing a character? Was he so sensitive, so hyper aware at, at this stage in his young life of, of maintaining this image that he fed into it whenever a camera w was pointed his way? Eric, that's a, it's an excellent observation. It's a combination. And um, no one's ever asked me that question before. There's a lot of components. First of all, yes, it was staged. And they sort of knew what uh, Eric, and, and Eric uh, Gig Young knew exactly what he was going to say. And he told James Dean, this is what we're going to talk about. All right. When James Dean is sitting in that chair, sort of slouching and playing with his rope and adjusting his hat, he is showing the brilliance of method acting. You'll see his hand moments. You'll see how he smokes his cigarette, how he touches his face. It's what people do when they, when they talk. But it was all staged. And, of course, you didn't know what James Dean was going to say. But he said, well, I, you know, now that I'm racing, there's a lot of men that put rules together to be safe and you know, I'm extra cautious now on the public highway because you don't know what this guy's going to do or that guy's going to do. Well, isn't that ironic? Because that's exactly what happened on September 30th. He basically thought, oh, that guy's going to see me. He's going to stop. No, he didn't stop. He didn't see him initially. And there was this horrific crash. And was he being extra cautious? No, he wasn't. He was speeding. He was reckless. And he was the reckless person that they like to attribute to the movie Giant. I see James Dean as a different individual. I, I saw and still believe that James Dean was an artistic genius. He had so many talents, and acting was one of them. And he played the role of the rebel to a T. And that's why the movie was so popular. And, and he played a misguided individual in uh, East of Eden, you know, a person that couldn't handle rejection, saw himself as an abandonment. And that's, that was his real life. I mean, from the time that his mother died, he had issues of abandonment from his father and rejection issues. And 
his acting abilities brought him out of that shadow, out of that dark shadow. So it's an interesting case study. And it, my case study didn't happen overnight. It's, I started to really get involved with James Dean when I wrote my first article in 1977. I mean, to me, it was just a blink away, but it's been many decades. So in the last year or two of his life, as things were really coming together for him, and he had, of course, this charm, these good looks, which opened doors, of course. But do you think he had fallen into this Hollywood mindset where he believed what people were saying about him, that that he was uh, special, that he could do no wrong? I, I guess what I'm trying to ask is that in those final seconds of his life, this is pure speculation, of course, but you, you've studied him for so long. Do you think he was thinking, you know, hey, I'm James Dean. Nothing bad is going to happen to me. The answer is yes and no, Eric. Um, I think James Dean was uncomfortable in his own skin. I, I, believe that, um, I believe that there was a shyness about him. He didn't want to conform to the Hollywood shishi gala, you know, atmosphere. He um, avoided going to his opening in New York of East of Eden. He uh, had a lot of friends, but only a few close friends. And he moved from, his friends evolved from movie to movie. In other words, he had friends during East of Eden, but once he got on Rebel, he had a new set of friends. And on Giant, he had a new set of friends. Uh, Someone like um, Dennis Hopper, who starred in, uh, Rebel Without a Cause and Giant with, with him, couldn't get close, wanted desperately to be James Dean's friend and talks about their friendship, but I've never seen a photo, a photograph of either of them together socially off the set. He he was friendly with Lou Bracker. I think the two of them had a good time together, but they didn't, you know, they didn't mingle socially. He went to social performances because Warner told him to, and arrange for dates uh, with uh, other people, Ursula Andrews, Terry Moore. James Dean had a very diverse circle of friends that were men, women, individuals of color. He was a very liberal-minded individual, although most likely he was a conscientious objector and um, disagreed with the draft, didn't serve in the, in the armed forces. Very complex individual. So I think that I used the term that he was a chameleon. As an actor, I think he was a chameleon in real life as well. He showed many different aspects. And you didn't know sometimes whether he was acting or not. What, the point I would like to make that you brought up was the, in the PSA. This was one one of the few times that you actually saw James Dean talking as James Dean, not as Jet Rink, although he was dressed for the occasion, but that was James Dean talking. There were very few interviews. I only know of one other interview where James Dean talked about himself and being prepared, getting prepared for a movie. And I believe the interviewer was Hedda Hopper while they were making Rebel. There, There aren't any videos of James Dean talking casually with anybody. No one recorded that. There were plenty of photographs. He had a good sense of humor. You could see him laughing. He had a great giggle. He was a nice looking, very handsome man uh, that appealed. James Dean appealed to both men and women. It's very significant. I think James Dean was a very complex individual, but a very unique individual as well. Right. There is a, a screen test uh, also available to watch on, on YouTube, where he and Paul Newman are together. And Dean shows some vulnerability in, in that video. He drops his guard in these interactions with Newman. You, you've seen that, I assume. Well, that's a good example. And there are other, other interviews uh, that they did, or screen tests that they did with uh, cast members for Rebel. He would clown around with a cigarette, for example. But he saw Newman as a threat to him because they both were vying for the role as Cal Trask in East of Eden. And Jimmy was selected because he was younger and he fit 
the role of Caltrask. And I think Eli Kazan saw his method acting as being instrumental for the role, which, you know, as you as you may or may not know, he was nominated uh, for an Academy Award in both East of Eden and Giant uh, posthumously after, you know, well after he, he passed away. He was nominated but did not win. And he holds that distinction of being nominated twice after his death. No other actor has, has reached that proportion. Do you think if he had lived, he would have followed the same trajectory as Newman? Is that, do you think, where his career would have gone like Paul Newman's? I think Paul Newman is a, is a perfect example as opposed to uh, others. You know, everyone likes to talk about motor racing and Paul Newman and Steve McQueen. Steve McQueen was the better driver initially, but Paul Newman was also a very, very accomplished driver that didn't start into motor racing till he was 50 years old. Uh, I never, I never had the opportunity. I did not have the opportunity to interview Steve McQueen because he had passed. But I became friends with Paul Newman and asked him a series of questions uh, around 2004 about his role, James Dean's role, you know, whether he watched James Dean as a racer. He said he wasn't interested in cars until much later in life. But Paul Newman was perhaps the superior actor. That's not to say that James Dean couldn't have reached that status. I think that Dean... Uh, was more interested in uh, photography and becoming a director. I think that he challenged uh, the direction in George Stevens when they were making Giant. Stevens would have Dean shoot and reshoot and reshoot the scene many different ways so that he could, you know, pick the, the, the superior performance where James Dean said, you know what, I do it once. and Once will be good enough because I'm giving it my all. I think James Dean was right. As I said before, I thought James Dean, and I refer to him as an artistic genius, not just in acting, but in sculpting, painting, dancing, playing a musical instrument. He did everything except sing. He was a very talented guy. So we've covered this on this show before, the idea that there are certain people, celebrities, well-known public figures, people who might have been popular before their passing, but became iconic in death. John Dillinger comes to mind, you know, even Anastasia Romanoff. Uh, and James Dean certainly falls into that category. Some people just don't want to believe that he died in the way that he did. And there have been wild rumors for years that James Dean somehow survived the crash. What do you make of them? Well, those rumors... Those rumors found their way to print in what I call the Pulp Fiction magazines. You know, somebody was paid $25 to write about James Dean once upon a time. Yeah, they saw it. Uh, p the, people see it as being morbid. Uh, there was a rumor, well, he's disfigured. He's living in um, some kind of, um, you know, reclusive uh, environment, some home, a sanitarium. <laughs> and, um, well, that's just um, a cheap trick because he did die. And um, I think what's more interesting, Eric, is that he died young at 24. He was a good-looking corpse. He, he was handsome. He had a great head of hair. He wore Lee jeans, not Levi's, but Lee jeans and boots and smoked a cigarette. He was a cool guy. He was a cool guy. He, 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 today, He's still 24 years old, and Marilyn Monroe is still young and pretty. And um, uh, I think the younger generation, today's younger generation, or today's generation um, of both men and women, find James Dean attractive, but they don't know the history of him. They may not know his real name, but they recognize, they recognize the individual visually uh, for who he is. And... Uh, I read a lot of um, advertisements that James Dean was a fashion setter. Well, he was anything but a fashion setter. He he didn't have a wardrobe of clothes. He wore a lot of, <laughs> interesting, he wore a lot of wardrobe 
off off the sound set. You know, he didn't have his own uh, wardrobe. And um, they say that he was the uh, promoter of the T-shirt. Well, he was the promoter of the V-neck T-shirt, but not the regular T-shirt. He was one of the first individuals that I saw wearing a V-neck T-shirt. And that shows up at uh, the gas station, the mobile station on Ventura Boulevard. And that's what he was wearing when he was killed. And boots. And then they said that he... He was a fashion center with Ray-Ban sunglasses. Well, James Dean was seriously myopic. He needed prescription glasses, and he they didn't make prescription sunglasses in the 50s. He had clip-ons to his regular glasses, to his regular frames. He acted without his glasses, but he couldn't he couldn't see anybody or dr- certainly couldn't drive without his glasses. Seriously myopic. Uh, nearsighted. So it's interesting. I think there's, you know, there's a lot of, I I read a lot every day on the net about James Dean. There isn't a day that goes by where I don't see something that needs to be corrected. I always look to see if there's a comment section, but there usually isn't. (laughs) But, um, (laughs) you know, it's about the Porsche. It's about James Dean. It's about his, they like to say that he had a death wish because he's there was a couple of photographs where he had taken a rope and put it around his neck while he was filming Giant. So he did make a couple of statements, supposedly or purportedly, that he didn't think that he would live very long, that he would die at a young age. Again, that might have been a premonition. But his mother died before she was 40 years old and he was nine. So why shouldn't he think that way? Um, personally, I went through the same thing. I was nine years old when my mother died, tragically, in an airplane crash. I'm so sorry to hear it. uh, Well, uh, thank you. It's a long time ago, but my mother and grandmother, and this will be significant for you, they were flying to the Mayo Clinic in Minnesota from Omaha. And they went through a thunderstorm and a tornado, and unfortunately, the tornado portion of that storm forced the ground. It's called wind shear today. It forced the plane into the ground and they were killed. So at the age of nine, I guess I was orphaned to a certain degree, um, but my father didn't ship me away. He took care of me in Omaha. But James Dean was orphaned and his father, you know, who could have shown more love and affection didn't have it in him. So James Dean grew up, you know, with a lot of rejection issues, a lot of issues. It's easy for someone to say that he was a rebel. He was tormented. Now he played that, he played that part perfectly, but a lot of that came from, you know, an inner spirit that he had. A lot of authors like to say, well, he died, you know, in that car crash with that red jacket. Well, why do they think that? Well, it sounds good. It was 105 degrees that day, and he was wearing a T-shirt and sweating. He wasn't going to be wearing a red jacket. As a matter of fact, that was a prop. He never, he never took the jacket off the, off the stay the soundstage. It was just a prop. So I've had a lot of time to, you know, read and analyze and rethink. And, and I'm a pretty practical person. And the example, of the red jacket, is you know probably the epitome of how I feel. Just. It's um, what I call BS. People just make it up because it sounds good. And, you know, for whatever they're writing for, it's perhaps in their mind, it's it's a better article. But uh, the truth of the matter is, is that it's a disjustice to the legend of James Dean. And there's a lot of Deaners out there that care very much about this guy, this actor, but they're entitled to the truth and to the facts, not something that's, you know, that's embellished. So that's been, um, that's been, you know, I guess, uh, part of my work ethic in my writings. I've done four books on Dean. I have another one coming out. And I'm always learning something. There's always new information that comes out. And incidentally, you're, you know, the theme of your, you know, program is about storytellers and talking about the most notorious individuals or circumstances. And then I think that the disappearance or the curse of the, of the spider is not done yet. 
there's still a lot more to be said. And hopefully, you know, I'll be able to be involved in that and, uh, and, and perhaps being able to pass on, you know, some, some more factual information that, you know, yesterday we didn't know about. So you believe the car might still exist. Uh, if it does, do you have any idea where it might be? Uh, you know, my mind has gone back and forth. It depends on, <laughs> it depends on who says what and when. Uh, it's been 68 years. I, could, I mentioned earlier that it was on uh, George Barris's roof for a long time under a tarp. Two employees told me that they don't have any photos, but this is what they saw. I believe them. So if it disappeared theoretically in 1960 and it was on his roof for, I don't know, 10 years, that takes us to 1970, we got, we got a lot of decades to try and figure out where it went to. Um, the reason I'm saying that is that I investigated the Speedster. James Dean bought the Speedster in February of 1955, raced it three times, then he traded it in to Competition Motors for the new Spider. His best friend, Lou Bracker, bought a Speedster, but it was just a normal Speedster. And when he found out that James Dean had traded the car and he said, well, I want that car. And Jimmy said to Lou, well, go down to Competition Motors and trade your car in for my car. And that's exactly what Lou did that day. So he winds up with James Dean's white Speedster, Super Speedster, and he races it three times. And I have photos and there are photos of Lou racing. And Lou became a very, very good racer, an outstanding racer. But Lou wanted something faster too. So he traded James Dean's Speedster in for a new Porsche that uh, James Dean had a 1500 or 1.5 liter Super. And he traded it in for the new engine, which was 1600. And then Lou traded that car in for Carrera. And then he didn't give any thought to James Dean's car. It was James Dean's car. That's all it was. You know, it wasn't valuable. It was just another Porsche. So I found out who bought the car after Lou Brooke traded it in. And that person moved to Pacific Northwest and he sold it to the dealer. And the dealer didn't believe it was James Dean's car. And they ran a motor vehicle check on it. And sure enough, it came back with James Dean's name. And it went through a couple of other hands. By that time, it was a race car. It didn't have a top, didn't have any bumpers, you know, had been lightened up. And then the car disappeared. It disappeared after somebody that was the current owner crashed it into an Armco barrier and ripped off the right side. And the guy didn't have two nickels to rub together to get it fixed. So he parked it in his backyard, parked it in the garden, as the British would say. And it sat in the backyard for years and years and years in the Pacific Northwest, where the elements aren't like they are in Southern California. It rained a lot. It got cold. It rusted in half. And the owner, at some point, advertised it and sold it. And it went out of the country to the UK. And the person that bought it realized that he bought a mess. This isn't a car, it's just a piece of junk. So he kept it for a decade and then sold it to another buyer-seller type of person in northern France who also came to the same conclusion. By that time, it's missing an engine, it's missing a left door, it's missing the bumpers, it's missing the top. The seats had rotted away, all the leather had rotted away. The car was now in three pieces. And that person advertised it, and someone from Hungary bought it as a parts car. Now, we're talking about 2011, many decades later, and nobody mentioned that it was James Dean's car. That got lost in the, in the transactions. And this person that bought it in Hungary, he just bought it as a, as a, you know, as a spare parts car, he had a lot of other 356 Porsches. So it happens that his girlfriend bought him a Christmas present. 
around 2017. It was called James Dean at Speed, published in 2005 by Lee Raskin. And I published the VIN in that, in that, in that book. I published the history of what I knew at the time. And this guy's reading my book and looks at the number and runs out to his garage in the dead of winter. And guess what he sees? 80126 in the front compartment, the VIN number of the car. And in Hungary, in Hungarian, in Hungarian, this individual says, my God, I own James Dean's car. And that wow. creates a whole new story because he contacts me because nobody knew where the car was. And there were other people trying to duplicate the car. This bogus cars all over the country, you know, people are crooks, you know, they think they can make a buck by counterfeiting a car. They counterfeit paintings and Rolex watches and everything else. Anyway, he contacted me and it started, a, a, you know, a dialogue that lasted for years and years. And over those years, uh, he restored the car. The car is alive and well living in Hungary. And we hope at some point to have some more verification on the car and to bring it over here so it can be displayed in America. There was an attempt to do that and it failed because somebody said, oh, no, it's not a real car. And that person is a crook himself, and his name will go unnoticed, but shame on him. And uh, I'm not done yet because I will prove to the world and to Porsche AG and Porsche NA that this is the real deal. This is the real car that belonged to James Dean and that was raced by James Dean successfully and actually was the first Porsche Speedster to win in West Coast Racing in the California Sports Car Club. He was the first one to get on the podium uh, with that car. And that's a, another fact that Porsche overlooked. They, they were embarrassed or humiliated because James Dean died in a Porsche. And for, you know, 20 some years, maybe 30 years, they failed to mention his name. Um, you know, how, how childish of them. In 1993, they debuted a new model the Type 986 Boxster, and they finally mentioned James Dean, and the Boxster is similar to the 550 Porsche, the modern-day Porsche, um, and they mentioned his name for the first time in 1993. You know, a lot of history. This James Dean character is so complex. The issue about Porsche is even more complex. If James Dean had been driving a Ford or Chevrolet to his death, you and I wouldn't be having this fabulous conversation. It's about Porsche. And today, everyone would love to have a Porsche. They're very valuable. So James Dean picked the right car to die in, that's for sure. Oh, goodness. Well, this has been quite a trip over the decades. Quite a story. A story that, that still continues today. So is there a place, a website where people can go if they want to communicate with you, learn more about you and your book? Well, thank you, Eric. That's very kind of you. So, I'm Lee Raskin, and I live uh, on the right coast in Baltimore, Maryland, near Baltimore, Maryland. Uh, I have a website. It's LeeRaskin.net. It basically you know, has a nice background of who I am. It uh, shows um, three books about Porsche and James Dean, and the fourth book is about uh, the Pink Pig Porsche, which was a 1971 Le Mans racer, 917. It's an interesting and a fun little story. Uh, that that's my most recent publication. I'm I'm just about complete on James Dean and the 356 Speedster Love at First Sight. That'll be my next James Dean related Porsche book. I have appeared on a lot, a whole bunch of documentaries um, on cable channels, history, travel, reels, National Geographic, ABC, NBC. It's fun doing that, just that it's fun on your podcast, being able to talk about something that started off as uh, 
maybe a fantasy, maybe a hobby becomes um, becomes uh, my advocation, you know. So um, I am most willing to chat with anybody. My books are on eBay and Amazon. Um, the, my first, my second, my first book is uh, very rare. It sells for six or eight hundred dollars, depending on what day it is on eBay. It's called Porsche Speedster Type 540 Quintessential Sports Car. It was published in 2004. The second book, James Dean at Speed, was published by David Bull in 2005. It's now out of print. It's a hard book to find. And um, James Dean on the Road to Salinas, published by Peter Botensteiner, Stance and Speed in 2004. 15 and again in 2020 are all available. If if one chooses to buy it on eBay, eBay lets me know immediately that the book is sold. I contact every purchaser, introduce myself, ask if they'd like to have a personal description, and I'm more than happy to do that for anybody. And I always throw something in, like a photo of James Dean or something that's intrinsic along with the sale. I think that's authors should do that. You know, authors should authors should spend the time because you're writing hopefully you're writing a book, you know, for people to read, for people to nurture, to you know, to enjoy and and not to discard. It it's sad for me to see my books that are signed and inscribed on eBay for five times the amount that they were originally purchased for. But there's a lot of opportunists out there, and everybody has a you know, different feeling about ownership. So I find myself as being a unique author because I, I like to use photography as the centerpiece. Uh, I'd like to take a photo that has captured the image of James Dean and his Porsche and to write about what that photograph represents, who took the photo, when was it taken, why was it taken, who's in the background. To me, that's the essence of, you know, of the art, the art of photography and the art of publication. Super. Well, I so appreciate you taking the time you have to talk about this. Thank you again. Well, I'd like to say that it's my pleasure and, 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 and I'm honored that you selected me. And that's the kinship, you know, that we're all in. You're, you're an accomplished uh, author and publisher and, and certainly, you know, providing a significant and an exciting podcast. And I think that's where we are post-COVID. Uh, the, the podcast is getting stronger and more significant because, we can pick it up and leave it you know, and put it down, and, you know, and play it over and over again. And I think that it um, it's exciting. And I think that's where the film industry is going to capitalize into the future by tying into podcasts as well. Again, I have been speaking to Lee Raskin. His book is called James Dean on the road to Salinas. This has been another episode of the Most Notorious Podcast, broadcasting to every dark and cobwebbed corner of the world. I'm Eric Rivenis, and have a safe tomorrow. <laughs>